Welcome back to podcast 4, introducing the project by the Royal Swedish Academy on War Sciences on European Security and Sweden in tomorrow's world. In this podcast we will briefly look at a few concepts which are very important for the uh, project as a whole, deterrence, reassurance, action-reaction, perceptions, offensive, defensive, etc. Uh, could you say a few words about how you see the balance in our work between, on the one hand, focusing on preventing war through deterrence, and on the other, on reassurance? And also you have the issue that I know that you are very uh, attentive to about this question of action-reaction patterns to prevent premature, premature conclusions about the effectiveness of different measures in terms of security. Any security policy basically depends on the relevant and uh, updated uh, balance between the two basic concepts of de deterrence and reassurance. And secondly, also, uh, in order to understand security policy, one has to understand the factors of action-reaction. There is always the dynamics of action-reaction uh, that one must understand and relate to. There is also a concept pair of offensive and defensive, which uh, relate to the two. When we come to uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, to uh, deterrence versus reassurance, one has to guard that the word reassurance uh, is a little bit tricky uh, because it tends to have a different meaning in different contexts, whereby uh, reassurance of allies is one thing, and it is commonly used in that concept uh, for NATO to reassure Bulgaria and uh, Romania, for example, against the perceived threat. And there you have another concept, perception, threat perception and the power of perceptions. Whereas in the basic uh, original formula coined mainly, I would say, by and famously by Johan Jürgen Holst in Norway, uh, reassurance versus deterrence means reassurance the adversary that you have uh, uh, interest in having a basically uh, decent relationship and that deterrence uh, must be understood also by the uh, by the adversary in terms of uh, of uh, a basic interest in main maintaining peace uh, in in the region etc etc so for me uh, any analysis also on the contemporary world, and I think we are going to dig into this in our project now, will be to relate to those basic concepts. We have the, coined them in our basic documents before this uh, project started out, meaning that uh, even uh, in the very extreme cases of, for example, a small, small country like Estonia, for example, uh, neighboring an, an adversary uh, which is perceived to be uh, in, a, in an aggressive mo mode, maybe mainly by the main adversary, but you are a neighbor, so you are affected. Uh, so you need deterrence from attack and the deterrence from attack as a means to keep the regional peace also. And uh, But there cannot be all deterrence. There must also, for the long term, fact of geography and you're a neighbor, there must be also an element of uh, reassurance in, in that sense. So it's very basic, it's very important, and uh, we must keep in my, uh, this in mind as we pursue this project. And uh, about the action-reaction issue that is related and that tries to capture the dynamics uh, of, of the deterrence, reassurance, uh, balance. And in this case, it is the dynamics of actions re uh, giving rise to reactions, giving rise again to reactions, and you have uh, the risk uh, in any security policy context of uh, events spiraling, unless you understand that whatever you do, you must take into account the the uh, possible reaction by an, uh, by an, a perceived adversary, 
Uh, and uh, it goes on like this. There is always uh, an element of action-reaction that needs to be understood analytically and related to politically. Yeah, if I can take a concrete example from my own research, uh, when I did my dissertation on Soviet and U.S. aid to the Middle East in the in the uh, during the period sixty-five to seventy-three, I saw some interesting research from Harvard indicated uh, the almost perfect correlation between what the U.S. did in terms of assistance to Israel and what the Russians did to Egypt and Syria. They basically cancelled each other out. And the only real result was armaments on a higher level and less stability and potentially less peace and potentially, as we saw, extreme consequences in terms of level of destruction when war did take place, as happened in October 1973. It's a good example, and if I may add, uh, reminding that the concept of deterrence reassurance was coined by Johan Jürgen Holst and others following him, uh, having in mind the situation in the up, in the high north, where, Na where Norway uh, on the one hand was seeking deterrence uh, deterrence uh, by NATO membership, but under certain restrictions meant as reassurance. And then on that basis and with a safety uh, arrangement um, guaranteed, they could have an active uh, neighborly policy with uh, with Soviet Union at the time up in the north. So there are many, many key examples. And uh, my point would be that in order to avoid a situation globally and regionally of the law of the jungle, where it's all uh, action, reaction, uh, and uh, enhanced deterrence and reactions in enhanced deterrence in the absence of accepted international norms and or basically friendly relations based on trust, then it's a high risk in the, in the absence of, the, of those uh, factors for these uh, these dynamics, action, action, reaction to spill, to uh, to come out of hand and to be beyond control, and then the world becomes dangerous as it used to be and as it is again or will be again. And what you effectively refer to there is, of course, the, the uh, with the introducing the notion of the jungle is the recent book by Robert Kagan. Uh, on the jungle growing back, which has led to even official reactions on the part, for instance, of the German foreign minister about the issue of the international multilateral rules-based order. And, and, uh, and we are obviously are going to come back to that in many different contexts throughout the project. Yes, I was referring to Kagan uh, and others uh, seeing the same thing. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way of describing the the great uh, challenges that we are faced with now in Europe, in Northern Europe, and also globally. There, there is, if you allow action reaction to spill into only deterrence and competition of deterrence, competition over proxies in regional conflicts, etc., it becomes very hard to manage. Well, I. I had a very interesting experience in London the other day listening to young researchers discussing deterrence policies in their own country and came up with the conclusion that uh, on the political level there is this uh, simplistic notion of having a deterrent whereas uh, in reality what you need is to have an understanding of the process of developing both these uh, deterrence and reassurance uh, require certainly much more of an understanding than the simple acquisition of certain weapon systems. You are listening to an e-learning light podcast produced by Lars Erik Lundin for Lundin och Becklund AB. Copyright on and around the topic of Europe and security. Please do subscribe on the Lars Erik Lundin channels on SoundCloud or YouTube. Thank you. Also, do visit 
the ellilundin.org website and follow on at Londil on Twitter. <laughs>